Now, I am reading from the fourth chapter of the book of Exodus, verse number 13, I'm going to use as a text. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still. Now another translation says, Be firm, and be confident, and be undismayed. And see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land. The wilderness hath shut them in. You may be there right now in your own spiritual life. You may feel like you're shut in. No way out. Now listen to what God says in verse 4. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh. And upon all his hosts that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled. And the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this? That we have let Israel go from serving us. Now let me stop here for a moment and digress. When the devil releases his hold in your life. When that yoke is literally broken or destroyed. The devil will never stop to try to get you back into that mess you were delivered from. Some of you have been fighting that. And on this opening night, I want to try to encourage you with this particular scriptural reading. Listen carefully now in this latter phrase now, verse 5. Why have we done this? This is Pharaoh who is a type of the devil. Why have we done this that we have let Israel go from serving us? And he made ready his chariots, took his people with him. He took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with a high or a mighty hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and overtook them and camping by the sea beside Pehahirath before baal -Ziphon. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord, and they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Why did you do this to us? Now they're complaining about the man of God who brought them out of bondage and out of captivity. Is not this the, the word that we did tell thee in Egypt? This is still the people talking, saying, 
let us alone that we may serve the enemy, the Egyptians. For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. Everybody say forever. forever. Oh man, I love this. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. There ain't no backing up. There ain't no turning around. You're not going to run from the devil. Go forward. It may not look like there is a way out, but You've got to go forward if you're going to find the way out of your dilemma. If you're going to get out of that mess you're in, you've got to go forward. Move on. Stop worrying me. Get off your face. It's too late to pray now. Get with it. This is what God is telling Moses. Let me go on and read a little bit more. But lift thou up thy rod, and stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it. And the, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them, and I will get me honor upon Pharaoh. And upon all his host, all of his army, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. Hear it. And the angel of God which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all the night. God has a way of delivering his people. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. I'll stop there. But in your devotional time, I wish you would read those first four, maybe the first five chapters of the book of Exodus, and you will get the complete composite picture of what I'm trying to draw here tonight. But I believe that God has a special message for us tonight through this scripture reading that I have read to you. And I guess if I put a title on this message, I would call it a divine detour. A lot of times people think a detour 
is something that's bad. But some of you here tonight are going to make a detour and you're going to escape hell and you're going to make heaven your home. God has a way out of your dilemma. He's got a way out of your trouble. He's got a way out of your distress. And I believe that if we are obedient unto His voice, He will show us that way out. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank You for the reading of the Holy Scriptures tonight. And I pray that the anointing of God will mantle every soul in divine presence. Let it be a time of receiving, if you please. Lord Jesus, abolish every trace of fear and doubt and unbelief. And let faith come alive. Open our understanding to your spirit tonight. Don't allow one soul to leave here disappointed. But on this opening night, Lord, let it be a night of the miraculous and the night of the supernatural. In the name of Jesus we pray. And everybody shouted, Amen. And amen. Turn around and look at somebody and say, I believe you're going to get a miracle tonight. Shock them, if you will. I believe you're going to get a miracle tonight. Now, I am reading from the fourth chapter of the book of Exodus. Verse number 13, I'm going to use as a text. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still. Now another translation says, be firm and be confident and be undismayed and see the salvation of the Lord which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever what a text what you see today you ain't going to see no more that enemy is out to destroy you he's out to steal everything that God has promised you but you have somebody that's going to fight the battle for you all you have to do is fear not and stand still be not dismayed, but see how the Lord is going to fight the battle for you. And I'm going to change the word of Egyptians. Your enemy that you see today, you will see them no more after tonight. Woo-wee! That makes me want to shout. I said, this makes me want to shout. God sent miracle after miracle after miracle by his servant's hand by Moses. He is standing before Pharaoh, which is a type of the devil. And he says, thus saith the Lord, let my people go. And Moses, as he commands Pharaoh to turn loose, God says, I'm going to harden his heart and I'm going to not do it, let him do it. Now, it looks like God's working against you. And here, miracle after miracle, and finally, God gives him one more miracle when he sends the death angel through the land, and he's going to slay the firstborn of every household. From the king's house to the least one in the kingdom. And God said to Moses, tell my people to take a lamb and slit its throat, Drain the blood into a basin and take the hyssop and dip it into the blood and sprinkle it on the doorpost and on the lintels of the house. And when that death angel comes through the land and slays the firstborn of every house, when he sees the blood, he'll pass over that house. There will be a divine protection over the house of everyone that has the blood of the Lamb sprinkled on it. And this is symbolic of the New Testament church today that has the blood of Jesus Christ applied to their heart's door. There's not a devil in hell or New York 
York City that can touch your life because your life is hid with Christ in God and God has a, a miracle for you he has a deliverance for you if you'll just learn how to stand still and be not dismayed for the Lord is going to defeat the enemy in your life and he's going to turn things around and you'll not see that enemy again after tonight can you shout amen as I have read this, I want you to keep your Bible open to this 14th chapter. The first thing I see here in verse number 2. Now listen to it. Speak unto the children of Israel that they turn back. One translation says turn back. King James says that they turn and encamp before Pihahiroth between Migdal and the sea over against Beelzephon. Before it shall you encamp by the sea. This is a deliberate setup. It may look like you're doing the wrong thing, but God has everything under control. God says turn them around and put them into a position where the Red Sea is there and mountains on both sides and then I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart and he's going to come after you and you're going to be like cheese in a rat trap but God is going to use you to put the devil where he belongs and that's under your feet because you are more than a conqueror. Hallelujah! Now it may look like you're in a trap tonight. It may look like there's no way out. But I want you to know God's got everything under control. And God has been with you every step that you have taken. The devil fought it for your bad. But God's going to turn it around. And he's going to perform a miracle. And he's going to show you a way out. And your deliverance is nigh unto you. It may look like a deliberate setup, but I want you to know that God is preparing the need. Look at verse 3. Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, God even knows what the enemy is going to say. They are entangled in the land. The wilderness hath shut them in. This is what the devil is going to say. You're shut in. Now what are you going to do? I'll harden Pharaoh's heart. He'll follow after them. I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, his army, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. God has allowed you to be in that situation that you're in where the doctor says there is no more hope. You're going to die and not live. And God's standing in the vestibule saying, now it's my turn. The enemy says you shall die and not live, but I'm going to tell you, you shall live and not die because I'm going to reverse the situation. I'm going to make you the head and not the tail. You're coming out of this situation. It may look like you're locked in, but I am preparing the need and I am planning your outcome. Woo -wee! Somebody holler hallelujah. God said, I'll honor, I'll harden Pharaoh's heart. He'll follow after them in verse 4. I will be honored upon Pharaoh. And he shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. He plans the outcome. And then he proceeds with the plan. And then he carries it out in verse 8. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Listen. The king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel, and the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with a high hand. Everything that God said he's going to do, he did it. Here we go blaming it on the devil, but God has his hand on your life. Are you listening to me? You have a God that declared he'll never leave you nor forsake you. You may feel like you're in a trap and there's no way out, but it ain't over till it's over. God's going to get glory out of it. I want you to know that God is still in the miracle working business. He had Pharaoh locked in the Red Sea. There was no way out. They heard the horses' hoofs. The chariots were rolling. There was no way out, 
mountains on both sides and the Red Sea in front of them and the devil behind them. Have you ever felt like you're between the devil and the deep blue sea and there ain't no way out? And you begin to have a pity party and you say, why, why did you deliver me, Lord? I wouldn't be in this mess if you hadn't have saved me. Of course you wouldn't, dummy. You'd have been dead a long time ago. But God reached down and picked you up and he's got a plan for your life and he already has the outcome plan for you. Victory shall be mine if I hold my peace and let the Lord fight my battle. Raise your hands and shout hallelujah. 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 Look at somebody and say, you're going to make it. Now the devil told you you ain't going to make it. He's a liar. I said the devil is a liar. Turn on the other side and tell the other person, you're going to make it. There ain't nobody on the other side. Pat somebody on the shoulder and tell them, you going to make it. you going to make it. I don't care what kind of trouble you're in. I don't care if you've got a Red Sea in front of you. God's going to make a way through that Red Sea. Victory shall be mine. Hallelujah. I thought I was going to preach a little ditty tonight on the opening night, but I feel like the preacher got here. I feel the anointing all over me. I believe you're going to get out of that mess you're in. God's going to perform a miracle. He's going to make a way through the Red Sea. You're going right through the trouble. God's got a miracle with your name on it. You're not going to be in that mess. He's going to start this revival off with miracles tonight. Shout yes, somebody. Hallelujah! Somebody holler, will you? Somebody holler! Somebody holler! Hallelujah! That's enough to make a dead Pentecostal holler. Hallelujah! the 10th chapter of Hebrews verse 36 and I'll use this as a text and maybe I might drop in the first phrase of verse 38 for you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God you might receive the promise and then verse 38 now the just shall live by faith and in this same epistle, the writer of the epistle of Hebrews declares, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. But they that come to Him must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Now, every one of you that are listening to this radio broadcast or listening to this tape, you that are here in this service tonight, you are on good ground because you are the listener. Faith comes by hearing. Open up your ears now and hear the Word of God and the faith that you, will, that you possess will come alive and you will receive the promise. I prophesy it tonight. Can you shout praise the Lord with me? Now the odds are against us, three to one, that, or four to one, that we're not going to get it. Jesus told us this, and as a preacher of the gospel, I am conscious of this. Every time that I preach, I am aware that some people will not receive it. 
Jesus said a sower went forth to sow seed. Some fell by the wayside. Some fell among thorns. Some fell on, on rocky, on stony ground. Three, I mean, there it is. Three negative responses. But thank God he didn't stop there. He said some of it fell on good ground. And when it falls on good ground, it brings forth fruit one hundredfold. Can you raise your hands and shout praise the Lord with me? Hallelujah! So I want to get rid of the negativity. And we're not going to think negative tonight. Thank God we're going to stir up the fallow ground. We're going to break it up. We're going to receive the Word into our heart. We're not going to be guilty of being hearers only, but we're going to be doers of the Word and we're going to receive what we come for tonight. Can you raise your hands and shout praise the Lord? Hallelujah! Verse 36 that I read it. You have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. But I believe this is one of the greatest problems that the church has today, particularly people of God. You have need of patience. I want you to turn over to James, if you will. James chapter 1, and let me read from the first verse. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. How many of you could stand a little more patience? Let me see your hand. Now, this isn't television yet. This is not going on satellite. This is radio. If you need patience, let me hear you holler, Me! I hear you folks in your home hollering right now. But I believe every one of us must make it this confession that we have need of it. Now, I have taken the time to copy this particular verses that I have read from the King James Version. And I took it out of the Living Bible. And may I read it to you and you that are even listening by, by radio. I want you to listen to the Living Bible, bringing it down a little closer to home. Dear brothers, is your life full of difficulties? and temptation then be happy for when the way is tough your patience has a chance to grow so let it grow and don't try to squirm out of your problems oh Lord I like that one don't try to squirm out of your problems for when your patience is finally in full bloom, that, then you will be ready for anything strong in character, full and complete. Whew. How many of you ever tried to squirm out of the problem? Uh, some of you ain't voting right now. But I believe every one of us are looking for the way out of the problem or out of the trouble. But God allows that situation to come into our life so that our faith can grow. That no matter what comes against us, we are the victor and not the victim. Can you shout Amen. God never intended for you to be overcome by the devil. He intended for you to be the overcomer. Hallelujah. No matter what comes your way, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Can you shout amen, somebody? Jesus said, in my name you shall cast out devils. I don't care what it is the devil hurls at you. He may knock you down, but you're not out yet. The fight's just getting started. You are the victor. Stay down. Take the mandatory eight count. And then get back up into the fight. And eyeball that devil. And go out right where he is. And let him know that you're going to put him where he belongs. And that's under your feet. Hallelujah. 
A devil has no business on your back. He's got no business on your knee. He has no business on your leg. He has no business in your stomach. He has no business on your husband or on your wife. He has no business on your children. He has no business on your bank account or in your pocketbook. There's only one place the devil has any right to be, and that's under your feet. Jesus Christ defeated him and destroyed him 2,000 years ago, and greater is he that is in you. Can you shout amen with me, somebody? Oh, hallelujah. I want you to keep your Bibles open because I want to turn to different parts of the Scripture. I'll never forget a little woman. The story was told of a little woman coming to her pastor saying, Oh, pastor, I I want you to pray for me. I need patience. And he laid hands on her and said, Lord, send the woman some tribulation. And she ducked out from underneath his hand and said, I didn't ask for that, man. I want some patience. Oh, he said, woman, that's how it comes. When you get the tribulation, God will teach you some patience like you'll never ask Him for anymore. Hallelujah. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Oh, when you go through the water, He said it will not overflow you. And when you go through the fire, you shall not be burned. Why? Because He said, I am by your side. I'm not talking about sickness. I'm not talking about disease. I'm not talking about infirmity. That's already been taken care of 2,000 years ago and God wants you well. But I'm talking about those other problems of life that you're going through. You have need of patience. But in that same verse, and this is the key, the crux of the whole message is in that 36th verse. It says, for you have need of patience that after. Here it is. After you have done the will of God. Now here's the heart of the message. And this is what I'm going to deal with for the next several days to you that are listening by means of radio. That after you do the will of God, you might receive the promise. This is how to receive it. Some people don't know the will of God. That's the reason why we need to spend time with the Word. Because this is His will. Can you raise your hands and shout amen with me somebody? This is the will of God. I'm reading from the 10th chapter of Hebrews and I'm using this as a text. Verse 36, that you, for you have need of patience... That after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. After ye have done the will of God. I want you to turn to Ephesians, if you will. Ephesians chapter 5. And I'm going to read just one verse of Scripture, and that's verse 17. Wherefore... Be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of our Lord is. I said I was only going to use one scripture, but I'm going to go on and finish it. Listen. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, I'm going to be coming back to that a little later on. But be not unwise. But the apostle here writing to the church says, Be understanding what the will of the Lord is. And I believe in this particular scripture, God has given us to understand what His will is. And there's three things that He's trying to bring out. It is the will of God for you and for me to present our lives as a living sacrifice to Him. Now you mark it down. God wants you. Every one of you that are listening by radio, if you're a sinner, you are hearing the truth then the will of God is for you to present that life to Jesus Christ. That is His will. For you and for me, you that are under this tent, every one of you that are here, the will of God, and without 
any hesitation on my part, every one of you that have been born again and washed in the blood of the Lamb, the will of God for you is to be sanctified. Number two. And I'm going to get into these a little later on. And number three, the final climax of it all, manifesting an attitude on our part of thanksgiving. I'm talking to a, a group of believers, I mean part of the body of Christ. Some churches don't know what it is to praise the Lord. I mean, they are dried up, full of dead men's bones. I had a, a preacher come to me once and he said, Brother Shambach, I used to be like that, but I settled down. I said, no, you didn't settle down, you dried up. God commands us to enter into His courts with praise. It's in style to praise the Lord. You don't have to praise the Lord when the preacher tells you to. You ought to come to church praising the Lord. Can you shout amen with me? Now first of all, I want you to turn back to the 10th chapter of Hebrews. I want to stick in this particular area. I want to go back to the first point. The presentation of this life as a living sacrifice unto God. You as an individual must present it. Now in this 10th chapter, Jesus is the forerunner. Look at verse 5, if you will. He is our the one that we're emulating. Verse number 5 says, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. This is Jesus. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Jesus knew what the will of God was in his life. And I want you to know that God has a will for you. There's a will of God for every one of you that's different from your next door neighbor. There's a will of God for me that Brother Durstein cannot fulfill. There's a will of God for him that I cannot touch. It is something important to him as an individual. And I want you to know there is a will of God for every one of you that are under this tent tonight. And it's up to you to find what that will is. Jesus was determined. He knew. While he was in that garden, he knew he was manifested in the flesh. He left all the glories and the beauties of heaven. He divested himself of all of his divinity and clothed himself with humanity. He became one with us. He became one of us just like you and just like me. He got hungry. He wept. He slept. He had the same desires and the same ambitions you and I had. But he knew he was born for one reason. And that was to die the ignominious death of the cross in order that you and I might have life and have it more abundantly. He knew this. This was the will of God for him. He said in the volumes of the books it is written that I am come to do thy will. O oh God. Only one time he wavered in the garden when he could not stand to drink the dregs of that cup. When he said, Oh, Father, if at all possible, let this cup pass from me. And then all of a sudden, he got a vision of Shambach in all of his sin. And immediately he said, Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Aren't you glad he came the whole way? Aren't you glad he suffered for you? Aren't you glad he died for you? Aren't you glad the grave couldn't hold him? But he came out of the grave and now he lives in you and he lives in me. And we offer our lives to him. Oh, hallelujah. I'll never forget when I got saved. On a street corner. That's why I love street preachers. 
Over in Honolulu, I saw a young boy down there preaching. I stood by the pole, egging him on. Go ahead, brother. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. When I first got saved as a young man, I heard a preacher preaching on the sidewalk. And I was running home. I wasn't about to stop and listen to no preacher. I had other things on my mind. And I was running right on by when all of a sudden he hollered through that microphone, Hey, sinner! I stopped. I said, Who knows me around here? I knew I was a sinner. Nobody had to tell me that. And I leaned against the telephone pole. And the next words that came out of his mouth changed my life. It's good news. You don't have to live in sin. Jesus Christ carried that sin for you 2,000 years ago. And when you come to Him, He will redeem you. He will justify you. He will cleanse you. And He will transform you by His power. And He said, I'll walk in you and I'll talk in you. And I'll be your God. And you shall be my people. Oh, hallelujah. Over in Philippians 2, if you have your Bible, turn back with me, if you will. Second chapter 5, verse number 5, if you will. Let me read it to you. Second, second chapter, verse 5. It says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross." I'm talking about Jesus Christ who came to do the will of His Father. He loved us so much that while we were yet sinners, He died for us. Oh, I come to tell you I love Him. And I want you to know what He has done in my life. I made up my mind. I came to do the will of God. I come to be a servant. And I come to be a blessing to others. Can you raise your hands and shout amen with me somebody? He is giving you and you, every one of you that are listening to this tape, He's giving you an opportunity to present yourself to Him. I am reading from the third chapter of Romans, and I'm going to use the latter part of verse 27 as a text. I'll read it all. Where is boasting then? This is a question. Boasting is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay. But by the law of faith. Paul is introducing to the church at Rome, but more in particular to you and to me who are alive in this generation, that we are governed by a new law since we have become children of God. And that's the law of faith. This is what I'm going to refer to it anyway, and you will know what I'm talking about. When I mention the law of faith, it takes into consideration our confidence in God, our trust in God, and our love for God. That's why that word faith is just used so much, and people just do, does not, they do not understand what it curtails and what it includes. You show me a person that knows how to have faith in God, and I'll show you somebody that has confidence in God. I'll show you somebody that knows how to trust God. Now, everything is governed by a law. This earth that we live on is governed by a law of God. The sun is the central point. Now, if this earth would rebel and something would happen that would take it out of its natural orbit, it would be nothing but chaos. Isn't this true? When it comes to a social law, many times I look back, especially when you're flying and you're coming in for a landing and you see all those homes in Dallas, and I say, how in the world do they all get along with each other? It's a wonder there's not anarchy with all the people that's in the world, but there is a social law that binds people together with mutual trust and confidence. Isn't it so? 
And as it is in the natural realm, there are spiritual laws that God has that's typical of the natural law. As it is in the natural, so it is in the spiritual. And God now, because of our coming to Jesus Christ, we are introduced to a brand new law, and that's called the law of faith, where we've got to learn how to put our confidence in Him and our trust in His Word and have a love and a devotion to Him that what He said, He will bring it to pass. This is the law of faith. You can't work that up. It is a law. Now, when Adam sinned in the garden, that law was broken. And chaos came upon all mankind. But because of our redemption and we've been brought back to God, then this law has been brought back into existence. Man has gone into chaos. A drunkard, an alcoholic, a drug addict, I don't care who it is, he has broken fellowship with God and he needs to come back to God so that he can have that mutual trust and that confidence in his God so that he can restore everything in perfect harmony. This is the law of faith. Now, and Paul spends the entire fourth chapter in this law. And I don't have time to go through every bit of it, but I want to go through some of it with you today. First of all, it's faith without works. Faith without works, faith, faith without classification or distinction. No matter who you are, not just to the Jew, but to the Gentile as well. Faith without distinction. Thirdly, faith without sight. And faith without doubt. And he is introducing this to every one of us who are children of God. God expects us to take him at his word. And it's introduced in this fourth chapter using the personality of Abraham. Let me read it to you. Verse number 4, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Do you remember when you first came to Jesus? Oh, I'll never forget it. It's not by works. People are trying to be, become righteous because of their works. They give to the church, and just because they give, they think they're righteous. Your giving has nothing to do with your righteousness. Your righteousness is as filthy rags, but we got to take on the righteousness of Christ. And He accepts us totally as we are, and we're transformed by the power of the living Christ. All things pass away, and all things become new, and now we are governed totally by one law, and that's the law of faith. Hallelujah. And God uses Abraham to bring this particular truth to our hearts. Not only Abraham who represents the patriarchs, but he brings in and introduces David. Look at verse number 6. David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying... Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. I can stand before you and with a clear conscience declare unto you that I am a child of God. I know my sins are gone. Oh, the devil will come and he'll try to bring up your past life. But I want you to know that we are not governed by what the devil brings up of our past because our past is hid with Christ in God. And if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. 
There's a new birth. The old man is dead. The old man is crucified. The old man is buried. But the new man is alive. When Jesus came out of that grave, we came out with Him and we live only by the faith of the living God. Can you raise your hands and shout Amen? Faith without works. What must I do? People come to me in the church. I'm talking to you Christians now. What can I do to be healed? You try everything. It's not what you do. Faith takes your works and lays them down and it picks up what God's done. Faith is believing what God said. If He said it, He'll do it. And if He spoke it, He'll bring it to pass. God said, He that cometh to Me, I will in no wise cast him out. And if you come to Him, then you must believe. It is all contingent on your belief. I am a believer. And I believe what God said. And as a because of that faith and that confidence and that love to Him, it makes it a reality. It takes out an old stony heart and puts in a heart of flesh. It turns the drunkard around where if he smells a bottle of beer, it'll make him sick. The harlot has been transformed to dignity of a woman. Are you listening to me today? A drug addict who has been liberated because of his faith and his confidence and his trust in God's eternal word that if he said it, he will do it. Not because of your works but because of what He has already done 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ died on Calvary that you might live. Can you raise your hands and shout praise the Lord with me somebody? Hallelujah! In the third chapter of Romans, verse 27, Paul says, what, Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law? Of works? Nay... But by the law, the law of faith. A law that is in existence, it is there, but we don't know anything about it. You talk about the law of gravity, and many people don't know what it is, but it's there. Whatever goes up got to come down. But it is a law that is in operation. And Paul is introducing us to this law in this third chapter of Romans. And in the fourth chapter, he sets out to define this law so that we can have a better understanding of what that law is. Now let's turn to the fourth chapter and read verse 9. I want you to see this. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. Now when you go back and read the life of Abraham, Abraham was considered a Jew, but he was not circumcised at this particular time when God imputed righteousness to him. And this thrills my soul. He was declared righteous not because of circumcision, because he was not circumcised. But righteousness was imputed to him because he believed God. And then after he believed God, he became circumcised. And God had you and I in mind when he wrote this. Even while we were yet sinners, Christ loved us. And that means that we can come in the filth and the degradation of sin and come just as we are. And if we will just stand there and say, I believe in Jesus Christ to be the Son of the living God who died on Calvary, and then you have the righteousness of Christ applied to your heart and you are in right standing with Him. 
Now you no longer have to run from God, but you can run to God. And you can say, Father, in the name of Jesus, and there you are in His presence, and you can ask what you will, and He'll give you the desires of your heart because of that law of faith that is operating in your heart. Without distinction. Whether you're a Jew, or whether you're a Gentile, whether you're a Greek, whether you're black, or whether you're white, whether you're red, or whether you're yellow. I don't care what your race has nothing to do with it. But it's faith without, ex- without distinction. That means anybody, to the whosoever will. And Abraham just believed God, and God puts it on that level. If you're going to be saved, it's going to be because you believe Him. Ah, let's move on a little further. If you're going to be healed, you cannot work yourself into healing. If you're going to be... God's not going to heal you because you go to the Assembly of God Church. He's not going to heal you because you're a Baptist. He's not going to heal you because you belong to the Word of Faith. But you are going to be healed... Because of one thing, you believe God. Solely on the grounds of belief. And this is what he's looking for. That law of faith. Somebody said, oh, if I just had a little more faith. You don't need a little bit more. Just use the little bit you got. Put it to work. Learn how to trust Him. I said, learn how to trust Him. Put confidence in your God. He has revealed to us His will in this Word. And He's looking for men and women who will stand on that Word that will say, live or die, sink or swim. If God said it, He's going to do it. And I stand on it. I believe Him. And it's got to come to pass. Hallelujah! There's only one thing that influences him. And that's in the 11th chapter of Hebrews. But without faith, it is impossible to believe God. Are you listening to me? You cannot please God unless you have faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. But they that come to Him must believe that He is. And that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Many people believe He was. Many people believe He will be. But God's looking for the person that will believe that He is. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the resurrection. I am the life. I am the truth. I am the door. Jesus operates in the now. Faith operates in the now. That faith is, law of faith is in operation. But we've got to come in line with it. Where we stand on His Word and said, if He said it, He'll do it. And if He spoke it, He brings it to pass. God cannot lie. It's an impossibility for God to tell a lie. Faith without doubt. Let me go on. Now, if He received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, a righteousness of the faith which He had yet which He had, yet being uncircumcised, that He might be the Father of all them that believe. Though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And I want you to know that the reality came to Abraham first. He had the reality before he had the outward sign, which was circumcision. Now do you hear me? A lot of people want to believe God for healing, but they won't believe Him until they get the outward sign. I want it manifested. That's a favorite word a lot of folks use today. Pray for my manifestation of healing. Abraham believed first. Are you listening to me? Before you receive it and get the actual sign, you've got to have the reality of it. In other words, you're going to have to say, I am healed by His stripes. You don't look healed. Don't care what I look like. The sign's coming later. 
faith was imputed to me because I believed God. And then after I believed, I got the sign. I was circumcised. Are you listening to me? Somebody says, if God heals me, I believe. God said, you believe and I'll heal you. You've got to have the reality of it in your own heart. For with the heart man believeth, and with the mouth confession is made unto deliverance. What you believe in your heart, it's got to come out of your mouth. And you get the reality of it in your heart, and then you will get the outward expression or the sign or the seal. By His stripes I am healed. So many people tell me, I don't know when it came. But I'm healed. I don't know when it left. Why? Because you believed it first. And the thing just vanished and disappeared. That's how God works. And that's how faith works. Raise your hands and shout praise the Lord with me somebody. Hallelujah! Chapter 3, verse 27 of Romans. But by the law of faith. Paul introducing us to a new law, letting us know we as children of God, we are not governed by circumstances. We are not governed and controlled by things that we live in and surround us. But we are governed by one thing, and that's the law of faith. If God said it, He'll do it. And He introduces us this it introduces us to this in the 17th verse, ver faith without sight. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him, or like him, whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Who did that? God did that. In the 11th chapter of Hebrews, the things that you see were made of things that are not here. They were made out of nothing. When God wanted light, all He said was, Let there be light! Here come the sun. He spoke it into existence. He called those things that be not as though they were. And now Abraham is acting just like God. And Abraham is a hundred years of age, and God said, As the stars of the heavens and as the sands of the sea, so shall your seed be. Huh? Hundred years old and he ain't got no kids. His body's dried up. There's no way he can reproduce. Yeah, but God said it. Read it. Let me read it to you again. Like him whom he believed, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. What was spoken? So shall thy seed be. God spoke it to Abraham, a man who had a wife, but even she was too old to reproduce. What am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is that God specializes in impossible situations. Many of you listening to this broadcast and many of you that are within the sound of my voice under this tent, you're saying, oh, if I could have just heard this ten years ago, uh-uh. God's never too late. But you don't know what the doctor told I don't care what he told you. If God said it, He's got to do it. If He spoke it, He's got to bring it to pass, but He's looking for somebody who will believe what He said. That's what He's looking for. He's looking for some... I'm going to be that one. I'm going to be the one He's looking for. I'm going to believe what He said. Abraham, 
you're going to have a son. Sarah's going to bring forth a son. And as the stars of the heaven and as the sands of the sea, your seed will be the same. Now if he was going by sight, there ain't no way he's going to do this. He'll take one look at his wife and say, forget it. And she'll take one look at him and say, ha, 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 God, he sure missed that one. And maybe you're in the same situation. You may be in a financial dilemma. You may have a crisis in your family. You may have the divorce papers already in your hand. God's never too late. I said, God is never too late. He's looking for somebody who will believe Him. Now, Abraham is just like us. We want to help God out a little bit. The flesh. The flesh always enters in and messes up God's plan. Sarah saw how futile it was for her. She can't receive Abraham's seed and bring forth a son. The man's too old and I'm too old. So what did she say? Take my handmaiden. God don't need no help. You think if you shout a little louder, you're going to get healed. It don't come that way. We try to help God out when it comes time to receive in the Holy Ghost. Say, dad, 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 my, 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 my. That's it. You got it. You know, God don't need no help. Keep your flesh out of this thing. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Can you shout amen? You all know the story. Abraham laid with the handmaiden and brought forth another race of people. And that's where the Arabs came from. And they've been fighting ever since. The flesh and the spirit. See, we bring it, forget the flesh now. I'm going to bring it into the spiritual realm. But this is our greatest battle. We're supposed to walk in the spirit. And we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But we're always trying to help God out. God don't need no help. He's just looking for people that will be a spiritual person and stand on His Word and say, if He said it, He'll do it. And if He spoke it, He's going to bring it to pass. Faith without sight. I don't have to see it to believe it. I had a man come to me and said, show me and I'll believe. God said, you believe it and I'll show it to you. Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, Believe you receive them. But I can't see them. You're not supposed to yet. Believe you receive it. I can't feel any different. You're not supposed to yet. Believe you receive it. When you believe you receive it, then you shall have it. Are you listening to me? God said to Abraham, you think this is too hard for me to do? I'm going to wait till Sarah gets 25 years older. Wait until she got 25 years older. And he made her laugh. She got pleasure in her old age and brought forth Isaac. And she named him, you know what Isaac means? Laughter. (laughs) She literally laughed at the devil and said, devil, you're a liar. If God said it, He's going to do it. Hallelujah. You may not have an understanding of how He's going to do it. When I look at that little baby, I don't know how God's going to heal that child. Somebody dying with a cancer. I don't know how God's going to do it. All I know is when I pray and put my hand on it, He's got to do it. Why? Because I believe His Word and He's going to bring it to pass. Hallelujah! Counting those things which be not as though they are. God wants you to act just like He does when you pray. By His stripes I am healed. Devil trying to break up your home, say, hold it, hold it, devil. Hold it. Whoa, back off here. This is God's house. You can't have that husband of mine. God said, whatever he has joined together, let no man put asunder. Yeah, but you got the report. Let no man put asunder. But it's from the judge. Let no man put asunder. Devil, you're a liar. God's going to restore it. He's going to reverse it. And he's going to bring peace to that family. Get your eyes off of the situation. And get your eye on the Word. What he hath spoken is what is written. 
so shall thy seed be. And Abraham believed that word. That's all you got to do is believe that word. See, but my church don't believe. I don't care what your church believes. Believe what he said. That's why you need to get this Bible and read it for yourself. Stand on that word. I shall not be moved. If he said it, he's going to do it. When the man of God lays hands on me, this is my day for a miracle. I don't care how I feel or what I look like, but I believe God. I receive it into my heart, and then it will become a reality, and you'll rise up and walk. The blind eye will open, the deaf ear will unstop, and the lame will leap for joy because you have believed God. Raise your hands and shout praise the Lord with me. Ninth chapter of John, let me read to you just a portion of this. But keep your Bible open to that ninth chapter, if you will, please. I'm going to begin at the very first verse. Follow me closely as I read. And as Jesus passed by. Now I could stop right there and have church with that. As Jesus passed by. He saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin that this man, or, who, wait, excuse me, let me read it again. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Everybody wants a reason for why you're sick. And even some Christians, they're not very beneficial when they say, you just get what you deserve. Did you ever hear that? Now listen. The disciples have a problem, so they're asking Jesus the question, the disciples. Who did sin? The reason this man was born blind. Did he sin? Or his parents. Now listen to Jesus' answer in verse 3. Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be manifest in him. This should answer every one of our questions concerning any form of sickness or disease. And then he goes on to say, and he assumes the responsibility himself. And he said, and I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. For the night cometh when no man can work. And as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is in by interpretation, which means sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came saved. You don't need no more. End of story. Let's bow our hearts and pray. Shall we, Father, we thank you for the reading of the Holy Scriptures. And I pray that you will illuminate the words to our not only our mind, but our heart and our spirit. There are people that are listening to the broadcast, and there are people that are here under this tent that need a miracle in their life. Let it come alive today. Let faith literally come alive. Don't let a soul leave here disappointed, but let this be their day of receiving what they have come for. We'll give you the praise. 
and the thanksgiving for everything, for we ask it in the name of Jesus. And everybody said Amen and Amen. I am reading from St. John's Gospel, chapter 9, and I'm going to use as a text the last verse that I read to you, and that is verse 7. You that are listening to the radio broadcast, I have read these first seven verses. Read it in your home. The ninth chapter of John, the first seven verses. But I want to use as a text these last phrases. Jesus said unto him, unto the blind man, Go wash in the pool of Siloam which is by interpretation sent, and he went his way, therefore, and washed, and he came seeing. To me, this is one of the remarkable miracles of Christ, the healing of this blind man. And this will blow the theology of many a faith teacher. I am a faith preacher. Here in this particular incident, there was no faith involved prior to the miracle itself. But Jesus' motive, he had a motive, the motive for bestowing this blessing upon this blind man, it was unsought. He wasn't seeking for anything. He's minding his own business. And all he's doing is sitting there, and Jesus passed by, and he saw a man which was blind from his birth. Jesus was moved by his own compassion. And I don't want any of you to lose sight of the fact that Jesus is a compassionate Lord. He's concerned about you. He loves you. He wants to give you the desire of your heart. Hallelujah. Now when you read these other Gospels, you will find Jesus responds to people that make a cry out to him. I think it was Lance when he was singing, was talking about Bartimaeus. When Bartimaeus cried out to Jesus, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. He responded to the cry of an individual. And all through the Gospels you will find his responses are different. Sometimes his disciples brought somebody and said, Lord, you've got to heal this man. He's been a friend to the Jewish people. He built the synagogue. And there's a request that behooves you to move in behalf of this individual. Then there are pleas that are made. But here in John, he is moved only by his own heart. And this is what I want to express to you. The heart of God wants you well. The blind man just sits there, not expecting anything, But Jesus is moved by his own heart that's compassionate, but the disciples move in a different direction. Read it. Keep your Bible open there now. And it says, And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? The disciples are having what I call a theological problem. What caused this sickness? And theologians generally do this. Why did this sickness come on him? Did he sin? Is it a direct result of his own personal sin? Or did his parents sin? And Jesus said, Neither! Oh, I love his response. And I would like to challenge every one of you that pray for the sick. I'm not saying ministers or clergy. But we're living in a day when believers are praying for the sick. And every one of you that pray and minister to the sick, I want you to take the same responsibility that Jesus did. He said, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, 
But this man was born blind in order that the works of God should be made manifest. And then he took the responsibility on himself and he said, And I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. For the night cometh when no man will be able to work. Now I've seen it and you've seen it. And I don't mind telling you, sometimes I get fed up with it when we see preachers praying for the sick and nothing happens. And they say, well, their faith just wasn't high enough. Take the responsibility on yourself. If you believe God's going to heal them, then they're going to be well. Hallelujah. If you're sent by God like Jesus was sent by His Father, then you can do the work of Him that sent you. Can you raise your hands and shout praise the Lord with me? Hallelujah. This is no theological problem at all. He said, the works that I do shall you do also. Not only these works shall you do, but greater works shall you do. Because I go to my Father. He said, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, cast out devils, raise the dead. Freely you have received, freely give it. Everything you got from God, if you have a gift from God, God gave you the gift. It's not your gift, it's His gift. And He's channeling it through you. That it belongs to God. But you are fulfilling what God has given you. Can you shout praise the Lord? Heal the sick. Cast out devils. Raise the dead. God called us to heal the sick. He called us to cast out devils and He called us to raise the dead and we're living in the final harvest and we're going to see a demonstration of God's power like we've never seen before if we can just find them and men and women who are bold enough to stand eyeball to eyeball to the devil and say, Devil, I've had it. I ain't backing up anymore. I'm not going to move. If anybody's going to move, it's going to be you that moves because God's given me power over you. You. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of deliverance. Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sin nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. And I must work the works of him while it is day. Jesus of Nazareth is showing us what to do. He's veiling His power under material means. He's veiling it. I mean, it's something that's obscure. This thing that healed was the will of Christ. That's what it was. But He uses the externals to help the faith of the man. Now, I told you earlier that Jesus is going to heal the man, but he's trying to raise his faith. So he uses externals, things on the outside to help him, so he spits on the ground. Now, that's not very healthy. I'll never forget when I was in New York on, on one occasion, I was preaching Brother Pennyman, before I met you, I was up on 160th and Broadway. I rented a theater there for a month and stayed four months. And we had a, a Holy Ghost revival, preached every night. Never forget this. And a little lady come by, a little blind lady. Never forget this as long as I live. And, and I, I had about 600 people lined up to pray for. And she stood in front of me. There was a usher on either side of her helping her. And I laid hands on her and I said, I rebuke the blind spirit in the name of Jesus. Come out of the woman. And then I put my hand behind her back to kind of give her a little help, you know, away. And she, she dug in. Like most women. And she said, I said to her, I said, come on, mama, it's done. And she looked up in my direction. Now she can't see, but she said, no, it ain't done yet. I said, oh, no. Not one of them. I said, come on, Mama, take it by faith. It's done. Thank Him for you. No, she said, Brother Shambach, you didn't do what God told me to tell you to do. I said, oh, no, you're not one of them. I mean, I talked to God before I come to church. He didn't tell me nothing about a blind woman. Now she said, God told me to tell you to do something. So I, I looked around, saw them 500 people. I had a lot of people to pray for. 
And this one woman's taking all my time. So I said to her, I said, what did God tell you to tell me to do? She said, God told me to tell you, spit in my eye. I said, say what? You got to spit it. I said, I ain't spitting on nobody's eye. And I said, God didn't tell you that woman. That's just your own thinking. I ain't spitting. I said, it ain't healthy. Health department will come out here and close me down. I ain't spitting on nobody's eye. I said, take it by faith. It's done. She said, no, it ain't done. Now I want you to do what God told me to tell you to do. Spit in my eye. And I'm looking at 500 folks lined up. I said, I got to do something with this woman. But she's obstinate. Just like all you women. When it comes time to get something from God, that's that tenacity. The kind that ain't going to give up. This is the kind of faith that hangs in there and holds on. Most people run off and say, well, I'll come back tomorrow. But not this little lady. She said, I'm staying here. You spit in that eye. She said, I'm tired of being blind. Oh, I said, Mama, please. And I saw them 500 people lined up. And so I said, all right. I held her eyelids apart. And I, I couldn't do it. I said, oh, Lord, no one. I said, please, lady, why don't you take it like everybody else? She said, Brother Shambach, please. And then she knows how to hurt a preacher. She said, you ain't no better than Jesus, are you? I said, oh, Lord. A lot of times us preachers need to be humbled. Sometimes we're too big, you know, with our robes on and our collars on backwards. And we want people to serve us and bow down to us. When God called us to be the servant to the people. Come on, shout amen, somebody. I said, God called the preacher to be the servant to the people. Jesus is showing us how to do it. Heal them. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. And my heart went out to that little lady. And finally, I said, all right, Mama. And she humiliated me in front of all those folks. And I held her eyelids back. And I just took a little saliva in my mouth. I went, <clears throat> and the power of God hit that woman. She leaped about ten feet in the air and ran around that Rio Theater, brother, up there at 160th and Broadway. God gave her 20-20 vision, and I had to go crawl under a chair somewhere. Are you listening to me? I want you to know people hear from God just like a preacher hears from God. That's what you said earlier, brother. And this is what we're dealing with. God's looking for obedience. And the preacher must be obedient too when God talks to His people. Do it! Whenever somebody comes to me and says, i got a word for you, I say, give it to them. I'm ready. I'm all ears. I want to hear what that word is. And generally that word is something God's already talked to me about. And it's just a reinforcement and a confirmation of what he has declared. Can you shout amen? But just to know that somebody else can hear from God, I welcome it. God said through Jesus of Nazareth, he said, The one that sent me, I must work the works of him that sent me. My wife will tell you this, the first church I pastored, the second church it was, over in Glassport, Pennsylvania, I spent more time in the hospitals than I did at home. I mean, I went around every bed. I didn't tell them who I was. I just took my oil bottle. I used a gallon of it. I'd lay hands on people and pray for them. That's what God called us to do. He called us to heal the sick. Amen. Hear me now. Some of you folks today, you're coming. I, you ask people, what are you coming for? You say, I'm coming for prayer. Well, if that's all you want, we'll give you the prayer and get you out of here quick. That's your problem. You're not coming for prayer. You're coming to be healed. Amen. And when you rightfully see this thing and set it in the order, then the man of God can do what he called him to do. He called us to heal the sick. And when we lay hands on you in the name of Jesus, God promised me he would put the nail-scarred hand right under my hand that the people wouldn't feel the hand of flesh but it will be the hand of Calvary and the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. Can you raise your hands and shout praise the Lord? That's what we're going to do today. I said that's what we're going to do today. This is a healing service. Are you going to get it today? 
Turn around and look at somebody and say, Today is my day for a miracle. Now look on the other side and tell somebody. Today might you in the end turn around and tell that guy behind you. Today is my day. Today is my day for a miracle. Now before I kick this next one in, listen, let me just sort of bring this to a close just for you that are here. This is not for the, uh, uh, for the radio audience, but the externals that God uses, they're just helps. They're helps to every one of us. To believe God. I don't care whether it's baptism or whether it's the Lord's Supper. It's not the clay. It's not the water. It's not the ordinances. But they're just ladders that God allows us to use to ascend right into His presence. Thank God for all the ordinances. But get your eyes off the ordinance. It's the touch of God that you want. And God wants you to have it. Today is your day for a miracle and he has your name on it i'm reading from saint john's gospel chapter 9 and i've been dealing with this one verse of scripture verse number seven jesus said unto him the blind man go wash in the pool of siloam and i love this now the parentheses there i'll just dismiss that he went his way Therefore, and wash, and came saved. Now here is where he manifested his faith. He was obedient. And this is the first thing that he wanted done. God is searching for obedience on our part. If God told me to get healed, I'd have to climb a tent pole. You know I'd start climbing that thing. All he wants is obedience. Now, he ain't going to tell you to do that, but I'm just using something absurd just to show you that it's obedience that he's looking for. Jesus spit on the ground, made clay of the spittle, put it on the man's eyes, and they said, now go wash in the pool of Siloam. It doesn't say they guided him down there. He knew where it was. I mean, he's from that area. And I can just picture him going down towards that pool. And he went into that pool and washed. And when he came out, he got one of them Pentecostal spasms. Ah! Glory, hallelujah. God gave him 20-20 vision back again. Are you listening? I kind of outlined it this way. It's the right time when Jesus passes by and you're in the right place. You're in the right place because Jesus is there. You don't have to be in, what do they call this place, in Lourdes where all these miracles are taking place. You don't have to run off to Canada. You don't have to run off to Springfield, Missouri. You don't have to run off down into Cleveland, Tennessee. You don't have to run off to the church headquarters, but Jesus is meeting right under the tent. You don't have to wait for anything. Everything has been set in order 2,000 years ago, and today is your day. It is the right time, and it is the right place because Jesus is here. Somebody said, how do you know Jesus is here? I brought him with me. How many of you brought him with you? Oh, hallelujah. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Even to the end of the age, I'm talking about a God that wants to do more for you than what you want to receive. Jesus suspends healing on obedience. Go and wash all through this, these gospels when you find Jesus healing the sick. When he walked into a synagogue, a man who had an impotent hand and he couldn't use it, he watched, marched in and said, Stretch forth your hand! Yes, Lord. Now you see, if Jesus would come into our church today and you were a cripple and sitting there and Jesus would say, Rise and walk, 
You'd say, uh, I've been in this thing ten years. He's not asking how long you've been in the thing. He just said, get up and walk. All he wants is obedience. Rise and be healed. Go wash and be clean. You are to respond to it. Obedient brings the sight. Take up your bed and walk. Oh, hallelujah. All he wants is a response out of you. And Jesus used these external means by spitting on the ground, making clay, and putting it on the man's eye, and they said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. No other questions. Just do it. Clay? Did that come from Arkansas? Is that that Mississippi red dirt? Root workers use that. I've seen them in Brooklyn, New York, selling dirt for $20 a, bag, a little bag. Come from Mississippi. Are you listening to me? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? New Orleans. <laughs> Louisiana dirt. Mississippi too, brother. But there's nothing about it. All he's looking for is obedience. Rise and be healed. But I can't do it. I know you. That, I know you can't do it. I said to a man on crutches, throw your crutches down and walk. He said, well, I can't walk. I said, well, I kind of figured you couldn't, looking at them, them crutches. But I said, that's before I prayed, man. Now get rid of them. Toss them down. And he tossed them down. I said, now move! And he started running. He come back and said, isn't it wonderful what God did? I said, yeah, even when your faith is weak, he'll do it for you. Isn't that just like Jesus? Oh, hallelujah. When your faith is weak, He'll give you the miracle that you've been searching for. He brings health to the sick body. If you're in sin, He'll deliver you from sin. All you have to do is come to the fountain and drink of His waters. Can you shout praise the Lord with me? What is it you have a need of? You want God to do something for you? I want you to know the Word of God works today just like it worked 2,000 years ago when Jesus spoke the Word. This is the written Word. This is the Word. Jesus was the Word. He is the Word that became flesh and dwelt amongst us. But we have the written Word of God that was given to us. And when we respond to that Word, we are the recipient of His miracle working power. What do you want Him to do? Home that's on the verge of being broken up. Divorce papers have already been served. I'll never forget preaching in Seattle, Washington. I had my tent up out there. And I was preaching a message on God's never too late. He may not come when you want him, but he's always on time. And I'll never forget, after I got done preaching, a little woman came and she brought me divorce papers which said final decree. She put them in my hands and she said, now I dare you to say it ain't too late. Well, I said, I've been trying to dare you to say it. So I'll say it. It ain't too late. She said, what about the final decree? I tore it up and threw it under the platform. I said, what decree? That's your problem. You've been looking on the decree from the court when I got another decree right here that said what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. I said, you still love that man? She said, yeah, I got six kids by him. I put my hand on her. I said, Holy Ghost, sick him. Knock him down and save that rascal. Fill him with the Holy Ghost and then bring him back to this woman and restore that family. I believe in restoration. Do you believe in restoration? Maybe you need to have your family healed. Not just your body. Maybe you need your pocketbook healed. My wife and I got in the automobile. We drove from Seattle to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I had a letter waiting for me. It was from that woman. And you know how she started the letter out? Brother Shambach, it ain't never too late. God saved that man and filled him with the Holy Ghost and we got married all over again. God cannot lie. He healed our home. God is a healer. Oh, 
Oh, hallelujah. I had a lady bring, I had her bring her purse. And, and instead of me laying hands on her, she put the purse up. She said, my sick purse, Brother Sam, that thing is sick. Lay hands on that purse. I, I need a miracle. And I want you to know God answered that prayer. Can you raise your hands and shout praise the Lord? Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Oh, I'm getting beside myself here. I'm reading from the ninth chapter of John. I've been in this seventh verse for so long, like there ain't no other verses. Jesus talking to a blind man, Go wash in the pool of Siloam. He went his way, therefore, and washed. And he came saying, Now, let me warn you. When God performs a miracle and you get healed, you're going to be facing problems in your own home. You're going to be facing problems in your own church. I'm going to do it. Dear. Because they don't believe in miracles. Just like this man. Listen. The neighbors, therefore. Keep, I said keep your Bible open. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him, that he was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? He was a beggar. He was blind. Some said, This is he. Others said, He looks like him. But he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, How were thine eyes open? He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus. What's his name? Jesus. Say it out loud. Jesus. What's his name? Jesus. A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. They said unto him, Where is he? He said, I don't know. Isn't that remarkable? They brought him to the Pharisees. The religious folks. They brought him to the religious people. The guy that was born blind. It was on the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. And the Pharisees asked him how he had received his sight. He said, he put clay on my eyes and I washed and now I see. Pharisees said unto him, this man is not a God. Because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. I want you to know when you get a miracle, there's going to be a division in the church. There's going to be a division in your neighborhood. Some of your neighbors are going to say, you've been well all your life and you've just been putting on a front. You've been going around saying you're dying of cancer and now you're well. There's a lady sitting right here, know what I'm talking about. Three years ago she was dying of cancer and God healed her. Here she is sitting here today rejoicing and praising God. Three years ago, God healed her of cancer. She wasn't even in the meeting. Her husband came. I was holding a meeting in the, uh, in the National Church of God. And her husband came, tears in his eye. Let me tell you, girl, that man loves you. He had tears in his eyes. He said, Brother Sam, my wife's died with a cancer. I laid hands on him in the name of Jesus. I sent the Word of God to where that woman was. He and I was in agreement and God performed a miracle. And here three years later, she is alive and well because of her husband's faith. Raise your hands and shout praise the Lord. Hallelujah! So they brought him to the church. This man is not of God, they said. Talking about Jesus. This man's not of God. He doesn't keep the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man that's a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. They said unto the blind man again, what sayest thou of him? That he had opened thine eyes. He said, he's a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind. There it is. They didn't believe that he was blind and received his sight. Until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. You see, they were Jews. They were in the synagogue. So they called the parents in. And I love to read this, so I'm just reading it to you. His parents answered. When they came, they asked him, saying, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then doth he now see? Question, question, question. His parents answered them and said, We know, we know, we know that this is our son. 
and that he was born, born blind. This we know. This is our son. He was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we don't know. Or who hath opened his eyes, we don't know that. He's of age, ask him. He'll speak for himself. They didn't want to be put out of the church. You're going to put somebody out, put my son out. He's the one that got the miracle. We ain't going to tell you. All we know, he's our son. He was born blind. I don't know how he can see. Ask him. He's of age. Oh, now they're getting hot under the collar. Church folks do that, you know. I said, church folks do that. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Hear me. If you're ever kicked out of church because of a miracle that God has performed in your life, it'll be the best kick you ever had. I'll be waiting outside that church to catch you. <laughs> I'll take every one of you because you know what the power of God is. Can you raise your hands and shout praise the Lord? Then again called they the man that was blind. Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. And the man said, well, whether he be a sinner or no, I don't know this. But one thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I can see. Then said they unto him, why did he? What did he to thee? How did he open your eye? He said, I told you already. And you did not hear. Wherefore, would you hear it again? Will you also be his disciples? And they reviled him and said, You are one of his disciples, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know that not from whence he is. The man answered and said unto him, Why, herein is a marvelous thing, that thou know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened my eyes. What he's saying is, you're the church folks, why didn't you open my eyes? You're the ones that's supposed to have the power, but you didn't do it. But here comes a man, you called him a sinner, and he opened my eyes. And now I come seeing. I got a miracle. I was once blind, but now I can see. Oh, hallelujah. Who's the blind man healer? Jesus. Jesus. And he's walking the aisles right now. I don't know about you, but I feel like having church. I feel like healing the sick. I feel like casting out devils. I feel like bringing deliverance to folks. I believe this is your day. God even sent a Holy Ghost breeze through this tent this afternoon. It's hot out there, but it's cool in here. Hallelujah. I'm healed by His stripes. I said, I am healed by His stripes. Isaiah saw this hundreds of years before the manifestation of Christ. He said, Who hath believed our report? To whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? He answered his own question. The arm of the Lord is revealed only to them that believe the report. What's the report? Isaiah said, this is the report. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. He reached 200 years ahead. And he brought that promise back to where he is. And it became a reality. Today, we look back to Calvary. That's the focal point. Calvary is where it happened. Before he shed his blood, he carried stripes on his back for your physical healing. He wants you well. Now hear me. The medical profession declares that there are 39 original diseases. There's a hundred sicknesses that stem from it. But originally, there's 39 original diseases. And guess what? Your elder brother Jesus carried a stripe for every one of them. Hallelujah. He carried it for you. He carried it for me. So I don't have to be sick anymore because I am healed by His stripes. Hallelujah. You ready for this? You ready for it? I was raised on this, folks. My mama had 12 kids. Whenever we got sick, she'd call that preacher and say, Get that oil bottle and bring it over here. We had prayer. 
said, who's your family physician? They told, asked me that in the school. Who's your family physician? I said, man by the name of Jesus. Huh? Where does he live? I said, in me, I think. But my mama calls on him every time I get sick. And you know what? I get healed every time mama calls on me. <laughs> hey! Hallelujah! Folks, we need to have this renewed in our spirits today. That's why I put this tent up. I ain't no healer. I couldn't heal a flea if it had a headache. But I present the healer to you. His name is Jesus. Now, he called me to do something. He said, you shall lay hands on the sick. And they shall recover. No ifs, ands, buts, maybes, or whatever. They shall recover. If I do what God called me to do, then he has to do what he say he's going to do. You believe that? I do too. You're looking at a miracle. I said, you're looking at a miracle. They were talking about heart transplant for me. Dr. Cherry was here Friday night, told it. Said I'd never preach. They said I'd have to sit down to preach. Did I preach today? And I didn't sit down. I said, sit down to preach. I'll just ask God to take me home. I'll go home early. But God kept me alive. He calls me a modern medical miracle. And he, I can go anywhere and preach this gospel. That's why we put the tent up here. To let you know Jesus loves you. I said, Jesus loves you. He loves you. He wants you well. He wants you healed. The prayer of faith. Let me just say one thought about that. Somebody says, well, who has to have the faith? Let me say it a way where you'll never have a doubt. The prayer of faith. Whoever's doing the praying. That's why somebody said, well, my pastor don't pray for the sick. Well, he ain't got no faith. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise them up. It's so simple. It's so plain. That's why believers, these young men can go to Africa. They can go over into Poland. I know what that is over there, the Iron Curtain. I've been to Russia twice. Hey brother, you just gone to Siberia. I flew over Siberia. I went where folks don't go. Nobody's ever been. I mean, it was refreshing for me. I went over there. I wasn't allowed in that country. I was blackballed. I was, it was impossible for me to get into Russia until God destroyed that iron curtain. Donna went with me to come, come, came and said, come, come, Chutka. You got to spit that one out. Come, Chutka. And you know what? I didn't have any religion to fight. You know why? Wasn't none there. The only thing I had to fight was the devil. Man, that was refreshing. I knew I was getting the victory now, brother. We had nothing but the devil to mess with. You know what we did? We established the church. Out of that church, four more has been born out of it. That's what you guys are going to do. You're going over there and you're teaching the Word of God. And we empowered you. We put something inside of you. I, I, there's only one thing, man. You made me feel bad. You said we had Dr. Osborne there and, and we had David. N you didn't mention Brother Shambach was there, man. <laughs> but, but isn't it wonderful that men of God like this come just to pour themselves into the younger generation to let them know they can do the same things they... Do you know who set me on fire? T.L. Osborne. I visited his tent meeting. I was in Bible college. I knew God called me for something more than to preach. He called me to heal the sick. And when I saw that man of God doing it, I wept like a baby. And I said, it's what God called me to do. If God can work through that man, he can work through me. That's the challenge that we have. Every believer. Remember this. If somebody else can get it, you can get it. If God can use Catherine Kuhlman, he can use you. Hallelujah. 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 These signs shall follow them that believe. How many believers I got here? 
Look at somebody and say, I'm a believer. All right? Then some signs supposed to follow us. Now we got it backwards. We're following signs. Signs supposed to follow us. One of those signs is you shall speak with new tongues. That's Holy Ghost. Another sign is you shall cast out devils. Somebody said, well, I ain't never seen one. You ain't never lived in Baltimore. <laughs> you ain't never been to New York. You ain't never been to Tyler, Texas. I mean, we got them down there, folks. No matter where you go, you'll find that devil. But thank God there's believers around that will not allow the devil to flourish where a child of God is. Every place I go, I declare this is the kingdom of God. And I declared war on the devil. I already walked around this thing. I said, this is the kingdom of God, devil. You can't operate here. We're taking over. The whole earth is the Lord's. And the devil has stolen it. And we're taking it back. Can you shout amen? Are you ready? Well, now, before you get healed, I like to put first things first. I want to see you get saved. And if you don't know you're saved, you're the one I'm talking to. If Jesus were to come tonight and you don't know whether you're going home with him, you're the one I'm after. What must I do to be saved? That's what Nicodemus came around at night time. He said, what, what, what must I do to inherit this eternal life, Lord, you've been talking about? He said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. He said, born again? I'm an old man. How can I enter back into my mother's womb and be born again? Jesus says, you're a teacher of religion and don't even know what I'm talking about. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. But that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. That's the new birth. You come to Jesus as you are. The problem with most people is we try to clean ourselves up and then we come. No, whitewashing ain't going to do it. He does, that's his job to clean you up. You come as you are and he does the work. It's already been done. The price has been paid and all he's been waiting for was a response out of you. That's why we put this tent up. That's, we, that's the reason why we go into debt for $100,000 to get this gospel out. To give you an opportunity to come to Christ. Bow your heads, everybody.